September 10th, 2020 meeting of the uh, San Francisco Integrated Pest Management Technical Advisory Committee. And the speaker today is Dr. Robert Kimsey from UC Davis. And I'll let you take it away, Dr. Kimsey. Very good. I should introduce myself as Bob. I'm a forensic Bob. entomologist at, at UC Davis in the, in the Department of Entomology. And I have uh, had a rather long and interesting career that spans forensic entomology, but also medical entomology. I was uh, a junior faculty at Harvard School of Public Health working on tick-borne uh, pathogens uh, for quite a little while in the early, sorry, in, in, in the 1980s. Uh, was an instructor at the Academy of Health Sciences at Fort Sam Houston back in the late 60s, early 70s. And so uh, this kind of thing that we're going to be talking about today, arthropod bites, or something that I've sort of brushed up against many times over the course of my career. Now, what I've chosen to do here is maybe take a tack that's a little bit trivial for the kind of people that you are. I, I was, uh, I didn't realize that well, I, for whatever reason I was, I was, uh, I was not taking into consideration that I'm going to be talking to people that are uh, that have your credentials. So I'm, uh, but on the other hand, I'm also thinking that taking the tack that I am might be the best way uh, to uh, because I'm approaching it from the standpoint of an individual who's had very very little experience with insects and except what they see on TV or what they had in in high school or junior high school or something of that kind. Um, and so let's just see how this works. I'll be really interesting to see how see what you think about it. So we're going to be talking about arthropod bites and bites are the term bite is used in every conceivable wrong way you can imagine when when when, when, when applied to arthropods. Um, and so what I'm going to do initially is to divide up what people call bites into three basic categories. And the first of those categories are what we call the real biters. These are things that actually do bite with mandibles or chelicerae, which are, which are, these are mouth parts uh, that are on the anterior end, end of the arthropods. People talk about being bitten by a bee. Now, that's a sting. That's something entirely different. Uh, but at any rate, and so uh, lots of different kinds of arthropods have different kinds of, 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 of uh, mouth parts uh, for different sorts of things from predators like this giant uh, centip centipede and this large uh, carabid beetle uh, to uh, insects that feed solely on plants, those that suck blood, and then those that eat other insects or, or rather eat, eat, eat other ar ar arthropods. All these different varieties of things can be ultimately termed as biters w with respect to the damage that they do to a human being. So then there are venomous bites, which include spiders and centipedes. There are no insects with venomous bites in the strict sense. However, insect bites can el elicit an allergic response, which in my mind, and in the mind of a lot of and most toxicologists, is different than, than, than an actual venomous bite. Um, essentially, an allergic response is where the, is where the insect uh, calls, calls down your various different aspects of your immune system um, to, uh, to um, as a result of the injection of a foreign protein. Whereas the venom is just exactly that. It's something that gets in you and starts destroying stuff one, one, one way or another, either uh, inhibiting meta metabolic processes or actually physically uh, or chem chem chemically dis destroying tissue. So uh, lots of insects have what we call antigenic saliva, that is, uh, um, it, it, that is uh, uh, compounds which then elicit a, a quote-unquote allergic response. Bed bugs and kissing bugs both uh, elicit allergic responses in, in, in uh, virtually every kind of human being, but, uh, but can also, in a, in, a, in a small fraction of human beings, uh, elicit massive over, overreactions. Um, and so the intensity of the effect of these bites varies from just a simple local reaction like a mosquito bite, or, a, well, not quite, actually a little bit more serious than a mosquito bite. They're more itchy and they persist longer um, and all the rest, to all the way to anaphylaxis and, and death. It depends on the magnitude of the response that that is elicited in the person the uh, variables as to whether or not a person uh, where on this spectrum of things a person actually um, uh, is um, 
are their their age, their exposure history. Gen uh, then there are people who have genetic predispositions to sen sensitivities of one sort or another. So just to give you a very quick example, I don't want to get too far off uh, off off uh, off the off uh, what I want to talk about. But um, as you when when you are born, mosquito example, uh, there's no response whatsoever. Your body has not yet learned that the antigens or the proteins that have been injected into your skin are different than what the body is. Now, but as you begin to be exposed more and more to mosquito bites, your body uh, gradually remembers the fact, it starts to remember the fact that there is this foreign stuff circulating around that is not from the body and it starts uh, mounting various different kinds of immune responses to attack the, those compounds. And so the majority of people then uh, with, with repeated bites will develop just a, a simple mosquito bite type, type reaction. For people like myself, who fed millions and millions of mosquitoes in in, in laboratory colonies, we uh, we gradually lose any reaction at all. That that is, the body comes to accommodate the fact that these foreign proteins are there and doesn't really care about them. Um, now, with bed bugs and kissing bugs, just as two examples, the exact same thing happens. However. In a small minority of people, instead of gradually losing the reaction with with numerous repeated bites, they the reactions intensify, and so and they they are cumulative. So that uh, the the more uh, so that as you are more and more frequently bitten, or more as you acquire more bites over any period of time at all, your reaction in in intensifies so that you get not just a local reaction but a but a systemic reaction so you break out in hives uh have difficulty breathing or restricted breathing uh and then um and so you know lack of lack of uh, oxygen getting to the brain you 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 become unconscious your uh, the upper part of your respiratory tract actually shuts uh sh um is closed off by the by the uh, reaction so uh and that's anaphylaxis and you get to die so but that's again not very frequent uh it's less than five percent of the population much less than that actually that actually that that that, that, that begin that uh elicits sorry that exhibits that kind of overwhelming response um so um at any rate so the uh the uh, next major group are stingers. Now, these are a sting is done with the tail of the arthropod, and usually it's done with uh, with modified egg laying apparatus. The major group for this includes ants, bees, and wasps, which is the order Hymenoptera, uh, and so. Um, some will actually bite onto you. That is, they'll hold on to you with the mandibles so that they can uh, get a uh, so that they can get a, a, a leverage to poke their stinger in. But that's technically not a bite. That's just grabbing onto you to to make the sting much more efficient. So with these with these modified ovipositors, very frequently there are poison glands. Now. Uh, I should explain what an ovipositor is. It's generally an apparatus that you use to lay eggs. And in different kinds of wasps, just taking one group as an example, these ovipositors can be uh, mod modified to bore in wood. They can modify, be modified to deliver toxins to subdue prey items that will ultimately be fed to offspring. Uh, so there's, so that it's, a, it's, it's a tool that gets modified in a lot of different ways. The ones that we worry about are the ones with the poison glands. Um, now, the, the other major group of stingers are scorpions, and they are one of the most curious groups of critters on the planet. We're really not too sure from what major group they derive. If you look at this particular picture here, this is a water scorpion, a Eurypterid from, uh, oh, this would be right in the early part of the Cambrian. Um, and it suspiciously resembles the terrestrial scorpions that we have today. Moreover, 
scorpions as a major group are one of the very first arthropods to 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 actually come out on land um so the the point of this whole uh, whole little dissertation is is that we're not really sure what their an antecedents are it could be something like this systematists say not bob kimsey goes well you know i don't know it looks a bit like a scorpion to me and i think there's a lot more work that that needs to be done uh, but whatever the case may be, this is an ex incredibly ancient group of, 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 of creatures with not only a very interesting system of behaviors to, uh, to, uh, that, that actually uh, regulate how, how the tail is used, but also some rather extraordinary physiology associated with, 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 with their poisons. It is true to say, we'll probably come back to this a little later, that great big black ugly scorpions like like this for the most part are not really all that terribly dangerous it's these little guys here uh, a group uh the genus centroides a couple of species which occur in southern arizona and southern new mexico which uh actually are the potentially more dangerous ones. um we'll we'll talk more about that later so then the last, so we've been over biters, we've been over stingers, and now a group that I generally sort of call oozers and stickers. And that is they deliver uh, poisons and toxins and other things uh, that are noxious to human beings with other body parts. And this includes such things as the bombarder beetle, uh, and then uh, the, a group of beetles that uh, also includes the very famous Spanish fly. These are Maloid beetles. Uh, and uh, and millipeds of all things, uh, and then certain kinds of Lepidopterus larvae. Now, uh, the uh, these uh, this particular group of beetles, which are actually parasites of Hymenoptera, have glands that they produce a very oily fluid from, which is incredibly ir irritating. The uh, the uh, uh, millipeds, interestingly enough have glands associated with the posterior end of the body that uh, produce really amazing toxins. Uh, in fact, hydrocyanic acid or hydrogen cyanide for all practical purposes, so that you can actually, certain species of these, you can actually take and put into a jar and, and, and put the cap on the jar and shake it up a little bit so that, so that they're all irritated and they start, um, they, they, uh, they start secreting uh, this stuff and all of them in the jar will die. They actually kill themselves. In other words, these poisons are really, really nasty, noxious things. We're kind of fortunate here, here in California that we don't have um, uh, a lot of, of uh, poisonous caterpillars, moth caterpillars. But in the southern part of the United States and the eastern part of the United States, there are quite a number of families of, of, of moths that have uh, really nasty, toxic, stingy uh, uh, larvae. Uh, the family Eucleidae, Megalopigidae. I could rattle off a whole bunch of Latin names if, 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 if you like. But they have very peculiar looking larvae that have tufts of hair like this allegedly cute looking little guy here or spiky spines like, like these um, silkworm moth larvae. Uh, a, a diversity of different kinds of, of spines and tufts. Um, these things get in uh if if you brush all you have to do is just simply brush up against them and these spines come off they get into your skin and they uh they are they uh produce a sensation called urtication a stinging very definitely stinging nasty itchy uh, um uh, immune response eliciting uh sensation the other major group, of, you're not going to believe this. I mean, nobody believes Dr. Kimsey when he says that that tarantulas, at least in the state of California, are not the least bit dangerous. I mean, they produce huge amounts of toxin, but it's it's almost like water. It's, it has very little, if any, effect at all on, on, on human beings in a relative sense. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But what they do have are vesicating or, or, or urticating hairs. So this guy, this guy here looks really dangerous and treacherous, like he's going to jump on you and bite you. This little guy is simply saying, what the hell's going on? Why is somebody taking pictures of me? The one here you really want to worry about. You notice that it's got its abdomen stuck up. It's kind of reared back. What will happen is the hind legs on this little guy will start flicking the end of the abdomen, breaking off these large hairs that you see. 
And those hairs then sort of shower the air around the tarantula. Uh, and so a small mammal like a possum or a skunk or, or, or a fox, perhaps, that's, that's looking to eat this tarantula, and it's got its face stuck right up against the tarantula, it gets its face showered with these hairs, which are incredibly irritating. So it's the back end of, of tarantulas, which you really have to worry about, not so much the front end. Now, having said that, I have to back off all that by saying in the pet trade, there are some really serious uh, tarantulas, uh, seriously dangerous ones, which we'll come back and talk about later. So let's segue into spiders. Uh, I'd like to take a look at each one of the uh, each one of the major groups now. Pretty much, okay, you know, you'll notice in this PowerPoint, I say all spiders are predatory venomous arachnids. All. In biology, never say all. I was giving a lecture very much like this a couple of years back, you know, to uh, to a medical entomology class. I was in, and uh, and one of the one of the little kid in the back of the room says, "Oh, but Dr. Kimsey, what about the spider in in Central America that that is not a predator, but but eats uh, highly proteinaceous gifts given to it at extra floral locations on plants?" I'm going, "Oh, kid, you know, come on, give me a break." So there is one spider, one group of spiders that is that is not predatory. One, but all the rest of them are. So, uh, so I'm still leaving my all up here, even though it's wrong. In any case, but but they have venom glands, and pretty much all spiders have have, have venom glands, and these are associated with their mouth parts, with uh, vertically or di lateral diagonally opposed chelicerae. Uh, and so here are some very famous spiders. This is uh, these. Uh, this is a saccard spider from South Africa. Um, this is a, another culturally related species. These things are pretty bloody toxic, and yet they very commonly exist in the pet, uh, are are found in the pet trade. Who is ever holding this in his hand is a loony, as far as I'm personally concerned. Now, um, but you can obviously get away with it because they are they can be fairly. Uh, fairly, uh, oh, pet pet worthy, I guess is the way to say it. Here in the state of California, these are the three big ones, and we'll come back and talk about each one of these. The black widow, obviously, is the very common one. We now have something relatively new introduced to the state uh, from Florida. It was introduced to Southern California. It's made its way all the way up uh, past uh, here in the Sacramento area. It's up in Northern California now. And, of course, the brown recluse, which doesn't occur anywhere near the state of California. In fact, it doesn't occur within a thousand miles. And we'll, so we'll talk about these. Okay, so the other major difficulty with spiders is their psychological significance. There are people who are just hysterically afraid of, of, of spiders. And, of course, because people like to be afraid or at least seem to enjoy being scared out of their wits, uh, the movie industry has made a big deal out of this. But having said that, I'm not trivializing the fact that they are the object of psychological psychological disturbances. There are people with spider delusions, terrible par par paranoia, and, and, and psychoses that are associated with spiders, as there are with snakes and a number of other critters which, are, which, which we worry about. All right, so spider bite. Let's talk about that for just a moment. In the general case is that there is no spider that seeks out human beings to bite or suck blood or any of these other ridiculous things that you hear people talk about. The uh, the spiders, in fact, any, any spider that does bite a human being is usually kind of bad for the spider because it's usually the very last thing the spider does before they get killed. Uh, now, the, the bite itself can be acquired when a human blunders into the web. My father... When I was a when I was a kid for the short time that we lived here in California after I was born was crawling under our house and crushed a crushed a uh, a, a black widow um, uh, against a, a a floor support uh, beam uh, with his knee and, and was bitten. That's classically the way that you are bitten by black widows here in California. Just as an example, so uh, accidentally crushing the spider with an unprotected it, it, Ex extremity. I was very nearly bitten recently myself when I bent over on the ground, picked up a handful of railroad spikes, 
and was carrying them along in our backyard. And I put them down on the workbench. And there was this enormous black widow spider that was in and amongst those railroad spikes that I'd had in my hand. You know? So that's that's the ki- kind of the way that one ends up getting bitten by uh, a, 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 a lot of different kinds of, of, of toxic spiders. Um, and then the third way is that the mystic- that the the spider just makes a mistake. It sees you move and 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 figures that this movement is is some sort of prey. And so this is a you have to realize that spiders are programmed to think of movement as potential food. And so uh, that's a that's another way that you can be bitten. Okay, so for a spider to be medically significant, that is to be something that we really have to worry about, it has to have three different um, attributes. First of all, it has to have an ecology that overlaps that of human beings. So the Sydney Huntsman spider, which is one of the most toxic spiders in in, in the world, uh, is generally not that terribly important unless you are an outdoors person and you go into the Blue Mountains to the east of Sydney, uh, sorry, to the west of Sydney, uh, Aus- Australia, and you camp out and you you know, so, so it's not a spider that normally is in contact with human beings. Its ecological preferences are places where human beings are not. That is not in cities and towns and things of that nature, but in, but in high, higher um, elevation forests in Australia. Uh, <coughs> so then they have to have the apparatus that can actually penetrate human skin. In other words, the chelicerae have got to be. Uh, robust enough to be able to pen- to penetrate your skin. And then the third thing it has to have is venom that is seriously toxic to human beings. So there's a whole lot of really potentially dangerous spiders um, around here, uh, sorry, uh, on, on the surface of the planet. But if the spider that you're thinking about lacks any one of these three factors, for all practical purposes, it's not medically significant at all. And because spiders are, for the most part, predators, they're quite beneficial. I mean, I have to admit that having webs underneath your eaves, you know, from all the cellar, the uh, cellar spiders that uh, the sequence of different species of cellar spiders that have been introduced to California is is um, is how does one say not exactly um, uh, 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 something. Well, it's it's uh, it's messy and it looks bad. But actually, it's a pretty good thing to have those guys around because they really reduce the numbers of insects you don't want coming into your house. Uh, So in any case, so the point is, is that many species exhibit one or two of these three um, uh, factors, but lack a third and therefore are completely uh, important. Just a quick little talk about brown spiders, the family Loxosalidae. There's approximately 20 species, and you can't believe what a lie that is. We have no idea how many species there are. There is a there's this incredibly interesting woman who is doing a lot of of assaying of, of venoms of spiders from this particular family all over the southwestern part of the United States, and she's finding pretty much no matter where she goes entirely different uh, kinds of combinations of, of, of compounds which make up the venom, strongly suggesting that there are that there's a lot of cryptic speciation going on in this particular group. The last count was something on the order of about 31 different species, but let's just leave it at 20 for the time being until such a time as that gets all settled out. They are relatively small uh, and delicate, long-legged spiders. Uh, a couple of centimeters in diameter with the legs stretched out. There's one or two species, Loxosley deserta, is, is, um, Air, Air, Loxosley's Arizonica is pretty big, <coughs> but that's a bit of an outlier. They're generally a very light brown or gray-brown combination of colors. Uh, it's been widely advertised that they have a dark brown violin pattern on the dorsal surface of the thor- uh, cephalothorax, and indeed that's true. But the problem of it is that trait is not diagnostic. There are quite a number of other spiders, particularly here in Northern California, that have that same tri- trait that are certainly not loxosalidae. Lox- uh, lox- and so uh, <coughs> the one trait that is diagnostic for this group, 
although the average person isn't going to want to look for it, is the fact that they have three pairs of eyes, uh, whereas most uh, spiders have four. So uh, you can see this one, two, three pairs of eyes. Uh, that is diagnostic for this particular group. It's a very odd trait, too. Okay, so just to take a look at the distribution of this particular group of spiders, you'll see that the greatest diversity is in, is in the southwest. Um, Loxosceles reclusa, which is the one everybody worries about, uh, the, 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 the official brown recluse occurs, uh, it's widely distributed in the central portion of the United States, uh, a little bit above the Mason-Dixon line, etc. cetera. Uh, doesn't go all the way east to Florida. Um, they were extremely common in San Antonio, Texas, when I was working there in the 60s, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, I used to have students go out and collect them. And in point of fact, I actually had students bitten by them occasionally. Uh, this was uh, this was in the military. Um, and so, but at any rate, you'll notice that uh, that there are no, okay, the, the next thing is, I'll, t I'll tell you is, is that this spider has never been introduced outside its original range. Period. End of story. Everything that you read in Time magazine and Better Homes and Gardens and stuff like that is just sheer nonsense. Uh, and physicians have unfortunately taken to diagnosing brown recluse spider bites in places like Maine, Alaska, Washington, Minnesota, and places like this. It just isn't. It just it, they it just isn't the case. The problem of it is that an awful lot of of bacterially induced lesions, including MRSA, uh, multiply resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, uh, or uh, which, which includes a group of incredibly virulent back, back bacteria known as flesh-eating back bacteria, produce lesions uh, that are alleged to be made uh, by, rec by reclusa. And reclusa can make those lesions, there's no doubt about that. But it's a very, very, very rare. The students, for example, that I had bitten in the San Antonio area developed little lesions about a dime to a nickel in size, which resolved in about three weeks' time. So, um, but at any rate, the problem with physicians overdiagnosing brown recluse spider bites in places where brown recluse can't possibly exist is that they're missing the true diagnosis, which is something like MRSA, which needs to be jumped on immediately with incredibly powerful antibiotics, or you're going to end up losing whatever was bitten. You know, th th those those kinds of, of lesions are non-trivial. And so, uh, quite frankly, uh, when you get the toxicologist sort of uh, you know, when you're, <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you get a few beers in, into them, they'll simply tell you there really is no treatment for the brown recluse spider bite. There are things that physicians can do to treat symptoms, but in terms of directly treating the bite itself, it's just, there, there just isn't much of anything. And you just simply have to let it resolve itself. But to not treat a MRSA infection because of a brown recluse spider bite is just simply criminal. So that's why you have to be very careful. Now, in the state of California, clear, there's no brown spiders of any species at all up, up here in, in Northern California, certainly in the Bay Area. There are one or two species which get, which there's one, by the way, interestingly enough, in Death Valley, all by itself. That's um, Russelli. And then uh, the, uh, and then the uh, L, uh, 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 Loxolosceles deserta, doesn't get up quite as high as this map actually indicates. It gets about as high as Bakersfield. But uh, at any rate, so uh, that's the story on the brown recluse. Now, it, just a, a quick pricey about its bi bi biology. It's a nocturnal predator of small arthropods. And it, it generates a very flat, two-dimensional glossomer nest, about three to seven millimeters in diameter. And it's generally... a underneath something closely oppressed to the ground. So under rocks or boards covered with organic debris, particularly under trees or shrubbery, is the kind of place that you characteristically find these things. And sometimes you can find them in, in pretty in pretty great numbers. Now, in the peri-domestic environment uh, that is around the house, you generally find them in undisturbed locations in garages, barns, and, and storage areas, uh, under boxes, stacks of paper, and particularly in wood piles. 
Now, having said that, this is in the peridomestic environment, this is how you normally find them. However, <coughs> in certain places in, in southern Oklahoma, uh, they can invade houses in, in enormous numbers. And I unfortunately couldn't find photographs that were sent to me by Rick Vetter. By the way, if, if you want to know more about the brown recluse spider, what you really should do is go out on the web and Google Rick, Rick Vetter at the uh, Uni University of California, Riverside, who spent his entire career debunking um, brown recluse spider distribution and uh, brown recluse spider bites. But at any rate, uh, they, they actually can occur in huge numbers in, in indoors. Uh, but that's, like I say, that's, that's not that's not a common situation. They are not found, for goodness sakes, wandering in gardens and in amongst foliage and certainly not out during the day. A lot of people don't really fully understand how blindingly toxic sunlight is to an awful lot of different kinds of organisms. I mean, just a few minutes in the sun and a lot of these things that are that live in relatively uh, cryptic environments and, uh, are, 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 are dead. And then the brown recluse spider is is one of those uh, kinds of critters that definitely avoids sun, sun, sunlight. So you cannot be bitten by a brown recluse spider by pruning your roses, for goodness sakes, as, as has been alleged in the, in, in, in the past. Sorry, having trouble with my little squiggly thing here. It doesn't want to... Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, the bite, if you're bitten by one of these, which is not going to happen here, but if you get transferred to some other part of the, the states, you know, it's within the, realm of possibility, within the realm of possibility. It may cause a small necrotizing lesion. Uh, the initial, there's an initial transient stinging. You can actually feel it yourself being, being bitten, but the sting goes away in just, in just seconds, uh, certainly not, not much longer than a minute or so. Uh, later on, you get puritis, which is itching, and then pain and a small blister, you do, usually within about three to 24 hours. Now, that blister may burst and maybe uh, develop into uh, gradually enlarging, enlarging lesion in about 48 to 96 hours. So um, the lesions are seldom bigger than a, than, than, uh, a centimeter, and they resolve pretty well within about six weeks' time. This kind of lesion, yes, it's within the realm of possibility that a brown recluse spider can cause that kind of lesion in certain kinds of people, but it is incredibly rare. That lesion right there is MRSA. And it's a darn good thing that the, that the person that's treating that wound is actually wearing gloves. MRSA is incredibly nasty stuff. There are very minor systemic systems to, to, to go along with the bite, but... <coughs> Um, but they're but they're not anything that need be worried about. On the other hand, it's interesting to note that the black widow uh, on on virtually every one of the characteristics that I've just talked about is um, is is kind of on the opposite side of the fence. They're very broadly distributed. They are, in fact, the widows are worldwide. They build a mess, messy messy three dimensional web, generally in hidden locations like the corner of your garage. I think every garage in the state of California has got at least one black widow someplace. They have a very serious neurotoxic bite. <coughs> this is not a locally acting toxin like it, like it would be in, in the brown recluse. The effects are central, that is central nervous system and, and whatnot, and they last for about two weeks. And you are really, really, really sick. Technic convulsion of the abdominal muscles, vomiting, Temperature going up and down uh, in an irrational way. Uh, but again, there's not anything you can do about it. You want desperately to be in the hospital, but in general, a good physician will say, go home and take some aspirin and just wait it out because that's essentially all you can do. So uh, uh, so it, go home and go to bed and just prepare to be miserable for a little while and it'll finally resolve itself. The brown, the brown widow is everything that the black widow is except... In terms of toxicity, overall toxicity, it's a milder bite. Um, the egg cases are totally different. Did I have a picture of the egg cases? In okay, so yeah, this is the egg case of the Black Widow. I'm sure you've all seen one. Generally, they're much whiter or lighter in color than that. Uh, whereas the egg case of the Brown Widow, it looks like a like a World War II nautical mine <coughs> with all these little pegs all over it. Um, 
And so, as you can see, the brown widow is has basically the same shape uh, as the black widow, except it has uh, its lighter gray with a with a, with a patterned abdomen. Okay, I've already talked to you a little bit about uh, tarantulas, <coughs> and uh, remember, I, I mentioned that they have these vesicating or urticating hairs on, on the abdomen, which can be flicked into your eyes if you if you make them angry. Uh, the uh, the the local ones are are nothing to worry about. Um, in fact, in fact, uh, believe it or not, there's a there's a spider guy in, in our department that's describing uh, a number of new species of of, of tarantulas here uh, in in this region. <coughs> so there's a lot that we don't know about them in a, in the systematic sense. The real danger here is in the pet trade. They are importing into the United States some extremely toxic, very large, relatively speaking, large uh, tarantulas. These are tarantulas that that come from Africa and Central uh, and South America. The African ones actually eat. <laughs> they're they are arboreal. They're relatively large. They eat mice, so that gives you an idea. It always bothers me when there's a when there's an invertebrate that eats vertebrates. You know, I mean that that shouldn't be the way it goes. It should be the other way around. At any rate. And then there there are some bird uh, feed, feeding uh, ones as uh, as well. These things are relatively large, and they have very they're very venomous with venoms that are actually designed specifically for vertebrates and to act quickly so that the bird doesn't fly away. Um, so uh, those are the ones you really want to worry about. And uh, the point is that there are an awful lot of people now. In fact, half the entomology club at UC Davis, which keeps these keep these things as pets, which is perfectly okay until they get loose. And if you're living in an apartment complex, where do you get loose to? Who's who's going to be the recipient of the uh, of uh, of the bite? All right. So enough about spiders. Let's go on to ants, bees, and wasps. The stingers. <coughs> Uh, females possess an egg-laying apparatus that we call an ovipositor, which is variously modified as a sting. In this particular instance here, this is Megarissa. It's a huge wasp. It's about, if you include the length of its ovipositor, these things can be about six inches long. Uh, the ovipositor is extremely long, and it's used for bor boring into wood at great depth and then uh, laying eggs on wood boring larvae. Uh, beetle larvae. So there's a lot of variation in, in how these uh, how these female uh, ov uh, oh, how these female um, wasps use their ov ovipositor. Now what this means is males can't sting. So you can catch a, a male um, uh, uh, tarantula hawk, which is a very large uh, um, uh, wasp here in California, and not get and not get stung at all. If you get caught if you catch a female and you think it's a male and you get stung, you're going to be in for some trouble because it's really, really, really painful. So males cannot sting. Uh, and the ovipositor can be longer or shorter depending on, on what its use is. Uh, <clears throat> uh, certainly, even this guy here, which doesn't have any toxins associated uh, with with this ovipositor that is effective on human can hurt you if it tries to drill you with one of these things, but it's just a physical it's just a physical injury. There are generally no toxins injected. Uh, now they can have this group can have venom glands associated with the with with, with the ovipositor, which are used for immobilizing prey uh, uh, animals that they will eat or feed to their offspring in nests or or immobilizing their host animals. Um, the greatest, what a lot of people don't really fully understand is the greatest number of hymenoptera are not bees uh, and ants, but they're actually minute little tiny wasps which, uh, which, uh, which parasitize uh, other arthropods of a diversity of different sorts. And so the, uh, 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 so they can be used for uh, parasitizing host animals. So they can break the skin and, and inject toxins, and the toxins may affect human beings. For the broadest group of Hymenoptera, if it does affect human beings, it's accidental. It's not as if 
there's been some specific uh, process, evolutionary process, to design a venom that's speci that is uh, specifically uh, meant to cause pain or to damage he human beings. However, in many kinds of social hym hymenoptera, the uh, uh, both yellow jackets and hornets and a lot of these things that have these big nests, very certainly honeybees, the, uh, the ovipositor is modified specifically for defense and the toxins, particularly in honeybees, can be modified to cause pain and, and uh, in invertebrates. The idea here is, is it's a defense mechanism because honeybees in particular have got you know, wonderful uh, uh, resources, which things like bears, skunks, and uh, raccoons and human beings really want. Propolis, wax, honey, you know, I mean, uh, and pollen, all sorts of different kinds of things. So that are incredibly nutritious. And so their, their nests then are uh, well, often eaten wholesale by bears, for example. So honeybees are the exception to the rule. They have an extremely toxic venom designed specifically to cause excruciating pain in mammals. So this is one example here of, of, of an animal that has a quote unquote toxin that is both it, uh, can both elicit, elicit an allergic response as well as have direct toxic effects. Um, that's not a particularly common attribute. For example, it's it. I don't. I um, the the brown recluse or the black widow spider, for example, has a straight up toxin. There may be a minute fraction of the human beings on the planet, on the surface of the planet, that are allergic to that toxin. That is a mild allergic response to it. But if so, that's completely insignificant next to the fact that it's actually having toxic, direct toxic effects on your central nervous system. Whereas here, honeybees do both. And so they are probably one, conceivably, I mean, it, um, you know, well, how does one say, taken at face value, they're one of the most dangerous critters around. But of course, we've been able to uh, modify them in certain ways. Other parts of the world, this is a typical honeybee swarm of European bees. But in other parts of the world, there are other species. Um, this is uh, Apis serrana. This is Apis, oh, geez, I forget the name on this one. But both these are, are, are found uh, in, in Asia, very several portions of Asia. Um, yeah, and I've seen them both actually in, uh, in work I've done in Indonesia. These, uh, uh, these uh, hanging nests can be three or four feet uh, from, from top to bottom and six to 10 feet from, from side to side. They're generally underneath branches in relatively speaking sheltered locations. Um, dorsata, excuse me, this is Apis dorsata. So anyhow, but that's an entirely different group. I just threw those in there because I thought you might be interested. The social wasps, um, you all know about these guys. The highly variable venoms. Their venoms are, are, are partially for defense, but mostly for prey capture. Most of these things then... Uh, capture prey atoms and bring them back to their nests to provision their nests so that their developing larvae will have stuff to eat. Some of these can be very bad. Polistes canadensis is a is a uh, wasp that runs that was distributed all the way from Alaska clear down to Tierra del Fuego as a single species. But there's gradient, a lot of gradients um, all on that north south axis as to how toxic they are. They're 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 bad enough to make uh, people want to strictly avoid them here in California. In Panama, they can be, they're all but deadly. Um, I was uh, stung by uh, by Polisius canadensis in, in Panama. And I was, look, I'm an entomologist. You can't put me down. <laughs> you know, there's no bug on the planet that can put me down, right? I was in bed for two weeks with, with those bites. And when I finally was able to get back out into the forest and continue my research. I was a, I was a panic stricken mess. Every time, you know, something rattled around me, I, I was, I, I startled and all the rest. Whereas I previously had for all practical purposes, been George of the jungle. You know, I was completely, I was going to say relaxed in the forest because I, 
because I knew what all the hazards were and, and I knew and they were defined for me. I knew what to look for. Uh, Canadensis down there exists only in transition zones and my work was not in transition zones. And it's in a transition zone where I got stung. And so, boy, uh, nothing like nothing like two weeks in bed, you know, uh, with unbelievably excruciating pain to change your behavior. Fire ants have recently been introduced to California. They are scavengers and predators uh, related fairly closely, actually, to um, to uh, to um, 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 oh dear. Um, army ants uh but at any rate they have these um uh in they tend to exist in the peridomestic regions you know in cities and and suburbs and things like that in overwatered lawns finally here in california we're getting away from having lawns so hopefully they won't be that much of a problem but in texas for example throughout the southwest where people still quote unquote believe in lawns they will uh, form these piles of tumulus on top of their uh, nests. These are very flocculent. Uh, you can kick. You can kick this over. It's just like it's just like dust, uh, and they immediately come swarming up out of their nests and will and 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 and, and they'll uh, crawl up onto you and start stinging. Their stings are pretty doggone serious. This is a reaction of a young person that's not uncharacteristic of what their stings are like. Uh, I had these things in Colony uh, at at Fort Sam Houston. Uh, in fact, I dug up the general's lawn trying to get out of the colony one day and got yelled at until they found out that I was, you know, getting rid of their their uh, their their fire ant colony. Actually, I was collecting it to to bring it back to the lab, use its teaching. Anyhow, the uh, so they are things that we don't want to have here in California. It's not just a matter of the damage that they do to human beings when when they sting. But they have the capacity for completely overturning ecosystems. For example, ground nesting birds tend to disappear in in places where these things become distributed. So uh, it's a very serious problem. Thankfully, I don't think we have any here in Northern California. The person to talk to about that would, by the way, would be Bruce uh, Bruce Badzik. Um, okay, army ants. I'm just just because I was mentioning army ants with the uh, with. Uh, with with fire ants, I just thought you might want to see some photographs of them. I've worked with both these species. This is Eseton, and I forget the genus on this one now. Uh, when I was doing research in in in, in Panama, in uh, in Africa, there's an analogous group called drivers ants, which don't sting, uh, but they but they raid and they um, catch prey on on mass, uh, pretty much like these do. Thankfully, we don't have any army ants of this particular caliber. Here in the state of California, we do have things that are closely related, other than the other than the fire ant, but uh, they're but they're not something that we generally worry about. Well, guys, that's my that's it. I uh, hope I haven't bored you to tears. Um, the uh, I'm hoping you're still all here. Uh,